Good morning, everyone, to the penultimate organic agronomy training with Dr. Martin Enns from the University of Manitoba. So my name is Laura Telford, the organic specialist in Manitoba. And it's great to see so many people here today. Uh, Marla told us this morning that we've reached about 350 registrants, which must be some kind of a record somewhere. And I see you guys are anxious to go. You've already got your questions uh, coming before Martin's opened his mouth. So that's awesome. Um, okay, so we're just gonna advance through the slides here. So just a few housekeeping things, just keep your, your questions in the chat. You will be muted and hopefully you have now figured out how to find all of the presentations. Can you go to the next page, Marla? So everything that you need um, from these sessions is in this one place and everybody involved in this has been very quick on the draw at putting these presentations and the recordings up at this link. Um, so, so go there if you've missed a video and um, to download the, the notes, Martin speaking notes, as well as the course notes. So um, just a note that this training is brought to you by the Prairie Organic Development Fund. Okay, next slide, Marla. And uh, we are extremely um, grateful to our primary sponsor, the, the Canadian government, and for those private companies that have stepped up to provide that hard to get matching funding. So a special uh, thank you to the organic companies that keep stepping up. Every time we ask them for money, they say yes. So companies like, like Grain Millers and Nature's Path and the Bauda Family Initiative, um, PHS Organics and FW Cobbs Com Company. And also a big thank you um, for getting involved in organic. Um, and I'm sure that uh, the Sask Week Development Commission has uh, funded other organic projects, but this is the first one with uh, the Prairie Organic Development Fund. So we're so grateful to all of you. So thank you. Okay, um, so without much further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce Dr. Martin Anz, and I think you are gonna love this presentation. Martin is gonna talk about the new science behind um, soil health. So do you wanna share your presentation, Martin? We can see your presentation. Okay, now you can hear me. I can you hear okay. me? Okay. Yep. <laughs> I um, uh, muted myself again after uh, Marla got me all set up, and, uh, <clears throat> and then I couldn't unmute. So I'm now assuming you can see my screen. Less yeah, it four, looks great. And you can hear me. Okay, great. Yep. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, so we're back, uh, back at it here, lesson four. Managing Soils for Organic Production Theory and Practice. So I start with this slide because it just depicts the three parts of the soil that we always emphasize. Um, the, you know, the physical parts of the soil, which, you know, farmers call the tilth and how well it crumbles, the chemical part of the soil, which is you know, the nutrients that are in there and how they transform. And even though that, you know, we are talking about organic production, we do have chemical transformations, which are very natural, which occur. And then we have the biological part of the soil, uh, which um, is critically important. But these three things together is really what we're going to emphasize today. Now, um, 
This next slide shows a map of North America, including Mexico, the United States, and Canada. And we had the great fortune to be involved uh, with a project where the Soil and Health Institute out of, I believe, uh, North Carolina, uh, received some funding to monitor the soils in all the long-term studies in the region. There were 121 of them, 15 in Canada, and this is the Glenley rotation, which we have at the University of Manitoba, uh, and we were fortunate. So they came and um, Charlotte Norris uh, did all of the soil health measurements that you could ever think about um, in the organic and the conventional plots at Glenlee. I'm going to share some of that data, but one of the overriding um, results from all of the sites was the importance of soil organic matter. Not a surprise to most of us, but a really happy thing to know that the soil organic matter was the most important soil health indicator in all of these long-term studies. And when we think about soil organic matter, we realize that we already know quite a bit. Um, this next slide here is from the Broadbolt plots in England. Uh, been around since 1843. And let me just share the soil carbon in the soil, uh, you know, the soil organic matter or soil carbon. It's the same thing um, at, at, at Broadbulk. And they, they measured this throughout the 160 or whatever years, and it's still going on today. And one of the things that we learned from this study is that even though the yields were pretty well exactly the same, where they used um, chemical fertilizer to enrich the, the crops uh, versus where they used manure or a combination of chemical fertilizer and manure. They had exactly the same yields, but the soil organic matter was massively different. So this tells us that manure is a driver of soil organic matter or soil carbon. So no big surprise there, but it's great to know. What else have we learned from history? Well, we learned that manure, which is so you know part of of some organic systems, is also important for soil structure. This is a fascinating study that's been around for about 120 years in the former East Germany, now Germany. And I'll draw your attention to the diagram on the bottom left. This is uh, looking at the um, aggregate pores and the bio biological pores um, that are made by you know, things like earthworms. And this is where there's been, oh, let's look at the bottom right here, where there's been no manure and no fertilizer. And if you look uh, at this uh, box above, we can see where a modest amount of fertilizer, of manure has been used and how much uh, more aggregation there is uh, in this three-dimensional rendering and how many more biopores there are. So this is just, an, you know, to get us warmed up. Um, you know, these, these organic practices have the potential to greatly improve soil structure and soil health. Okay, the other thing that we know, um, sorry, I'm a little bit, a little bit sniffly today. Um, the other thing that we know is that crop rotation is also a driver of soil carbon or soil organic matter. These are the Moro plots at the University of Illinois, the, the oldest crop rotation study in North America, um, started in 1876. And uh, they monitored the soil carbon uh, starting, well, uh, the data here sh starts in 1904, it goes to 1988. And we can see this road, all the rotations lost carbon, and that's just a function of agriculture plowing the prairie. Uh, but this corn, oat, and then uh, th I believe three years of hay or two years of hay, you can see it maintained its soil carbon a lot better than this continuous corn or corn, soybean, uh, and oats um, here, and then now just corn, soybean. So crop rotation is a driver of soil organic matter. And um, looking at, at another long-term study, this one, the DOC trial in Switzerland, which was started in 1978 and is the oldest organic conventional comparison study in the world. They're concluding that 
organic agriculture is a driver of soil carbon. And this paper is just published this year, looking at this biological soil quality and organic carbon after 42 years of production. And what do we got here? We've got uh, the organic matter on the left here. We've got this, this line over here, these uh, triangles, open triangles. That's where no fertilizer was added. Uh, the yellow line is where conventional fertilizer was added to soil test recommendations. And then we had some rotations where there's some animal, a little bit of manure going in. So let's take a look at uh, this conventional farming uh, with manure is the red line. Uh, but if we look at that under organic, it's the blue line. So something about the organic system has allowed the soil organic matter to be higher than exactly the same number of animal units under, under conventional. And I bet the difference is composting the manure. And then when they went to a biodynamic system, had even higher levels of organic matter. So that's, we've now looked at England, the United States, Germany, and let's come home to um, the University of Manitoba, uh, the Glen Lee rotation. What I'm showing here is, well, this is our, our long-term study uh, where we compare organic and conventional crops, and it's completed 31 years. What are the nice things about the Glen Lee study, and I have to thank Con Campbell uh, for this, is uh, we've got the prairie. Uh, we've got three blocks of prairie, restored prairie grasses in the system. It's tall grass prairie, uh, multi-species, and it's a very good benchmark for us. And so then if we look at the prairie on the left here, and we compare the total carbon, which is these, these numbers here, 4.4, 4.5, uh, we can see there is variation uh, between organic and conventional. Uh, the um, <clears throat> the forage grain organic with no manure added um, is uh, got a uh, organic carbon which is pretty well identical to the prairie. The grain only conventional has good good carbon. Uh, the grain only organic is low in carbon, um, and that's because we didn't have good green manures for the first fifteen years. But then if we look at another measure of carbon, this is in the parentheses or the brackets here, this is microbial biomass carbon. And what we notice here is that the, um, the, the organic systems, when they're in good rotations, have actually higher uh, microbial carbon than the conventional uh, cousin. So, so this is kind of what we've monitored, and I'm just kind of warming us up to the idea of, you know, some of the historical knowledge of, of, of organic matter. But now let's turn to the question, which, which I find really exciting. Like, how does that stuff, you know, the compost and the plant material become organic matter? And then what is organic matter? Well, I have to say that the understanding of organic matter and how plant material becomes long-term uh, soil organic matter, that understanding has increased. And the, the humus theory that we had uh, has been proven to be too limited. And so what I do, uh, what I've done many times is just get people to watch these videos if they're interested uh, to uh, hear from um, Dr. Uh, Cotrufo from Colorado State University, who has really done a great job of teaching um, uh, the uh, understanding of soil carbon. And let me just share some of what, uh, what we now know. The diagram on the left says not all soil carbon is made equal. Well, we've always known that. And people have talked about, you know, light fraction and have, you know, humic and all this stuff. But um, the two pathway model is the one that makes um, it is where experimental evidence is supporting the strongest. So there's two real pools of organic matter. There's particulate organic matter, and it comes from things like dead plant material. And uh, this is um, uh, a very important form of organic matter. Um, and then we have what we call mineral associated organic matter. And it is uh, basically the, it's called necromass. It's dead 
bug dead soil microbes, which are embedded in silt and clay particles. And to get into this form of carbon, you need to go through the soil microbial pool. Okay, so this is what's called the two pathway model. And as farmers, it's actually important to know these models, these two forms. Okay, here's another more complicated diagram of basically the two pools of soil organic matter. Um, and on this axis, we have the size. So it's very small particles here, even like, uh, like uh, liquids coming out of the roots of plants all the way up to larger you know, pieces of straw. And on this side, we have density um, and going from larger to smaller density. So this stuff here is what we consider this particulate organic matter. And then this, these smaller um, uh, particles are what we consider these mineral associated. So now you're saying, well, up till now, this talk was okay. I kind of have followed it, but now he's losing me. Well, let me capture you back. Okay. So um, the uh, maybe this helps us understand it in a farming context. So this particulate organic matter, it is stabilized in soil aggregates. And so this is an example of a soil aggregate where you get you got um, you know pieces of of straw and partly decomposed residue goes into aggregates and and the uh, biology of the soil is involved in this because the mycorrhizal fungi produce the glue that helps to stick these particles together and so they're very very important the aggregation and and I think most farmers know that they they look at soil and they they watch it flow out of their fingers and they know whether it's well aggregated and not. And, and there's some really neat things that happen just as an aside in a clay soil, like in the Red River Valley here, the soil self aggregates every spring because of the freeze thaw and just the nature of the clay soil. So clay soils can actually aggregate just on their own. Now, this particulate organic matter is really what has increased with no-till farming. And no-till farming has been very important. Nobody would deny that. And the, uh, but what happens is the, uh, you know, when we're looking at things like residue, dead residue, this is where it ends up in the soil, in these aggregates. And these aggregates, whether you're an organic farmer or a conventional farmer, they're going to break down and release the stuff that's in there, release some of the carbon. But that breakdown is important because it 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 releases all the nutrients in there as well. And so what we really think about in terms of farming is, you know, we build up our aggregates and then we decompose them because we want those nutrients, especially in organic farming, to grow the crop. And then we build them up again and we decompose them. So <clears throat> um uh and, and people like Henry Jansen have really reminded us that, you know, the soils are always decomposing carbon, carbon, and it's actually important for nutrient supply. Okay, so that's a little bit about that particulate organic matter. The other pool that I talked about is this mineral associated, and it's these dead microbial cells embedded in the, cells, uh, the clay and the silt particles. Now, the nice thing about this carbon is it's it's more long term stable. And I'll give you a table in a few minutes where we, you know, we talk about that. And I had mentioned in that two pathway model that uh, uh, Dr. Cordrufo uh, had uh, presented that to get into this mineral associated organic matter, you have to be processed by microbes. So some people call it the eye of the needle theory. For carbon to become part of this pool, it actually has to be processed by microbes. And so the soil microbiome is the eye of the needle as it controls the amount and the efficiency with which the carbon enters this pool. So very important to remember, and in a few moments, we're going to talk about 
the energy efficiency of soils. Now, um, there are a couple of ways. Uh, there is one other way that uh, plant that uh, carbon from plants can get into mineral associated organic matter, and that is it can be leached directly from plant from plant roots. Um, so this is called dissolved organic matter, and plants will about six to eight percent of the amount of photosynthesis, the carbon that they bring in, can be. Uh, leaked out of the roots. At our Glenlay study, um, we've had uh, collaborating scientists who've come and studied this, and they found out that our organic forage grain rotations had 18% more dissolved organic carbon or organic matter uh, than our rotations that only had annual crops. And so, um, so that's one source. And of course, the other source is um, the fresh plant material that's processed through microbes. Okay, dead plant material is not processed as efficiently. It is particulate organic matter. So, so I hope that you've had a, a sense now that we've got these two sort of pools of organic matter, the particulate organic matter, and then this mineral associated. So let's take a moment um, and describe them. So in terms of their protection mechanisms, um, they, uh, the particular organic matter is in large aggregates. The mineral association is in organomineral clusters. It's between the clay and the silt particles. The residence time in the soil particulate is less than 10 years to maybe, maybe a decade. The mineral associated lasts from decades to centuries. And so this already raises a, a question, right? So is the no-till carbon stable? Well, it's not as stable as over here. And that's why people are so excited about things like cover crops, because they can maybe add to this pool and not to this pool. Um, uh, let's just go down here to the carbon to nitrogen ratio. And what we know is that the, the, um, the carbon to nitrogen ratio is much higher for mineral for particulate associated, but for mineral associated, it's much lower. What that means is it takes more nitrogen to fix that carbon. And so this is where legumes really become important. Uh, bringing particulate organic matter into the soil is kind of cheap. It's in, in terms of nitrogen, it's low cost. This is higher cost. And that's why people think about legume cover crops or legumes in rotation. So I have listed all the papers from which I am getting the information. Um, and I have read every one of these papers multiple times because it's it's been years of work to understand all this. Um, and uh, But these are all available uh, open access online. Very, the, the vast majority are. So you can you can get them if you're interested. Okay, so so we've talked so far about this, this dual stream of carbon. Both pools are important. And then one final question is, uh, can this particulate organic matter become embedded into clay particles? And the short answer is no. Um, soil scientists, and, and, and we in Canada have the best among the best carbon scientists in the world, people like Ed Gregrich at Ag Canada Ottawa, Ben Ellert at um, Lethbridge, uh, Bobby Helgeson at the University of Saskatchewan and others. And you can see they're working together with, uh, down here you can see the publication, they're working together with Francesca at Colorado State University. So, but um, it's not thought that, that this gets, uh, th th these remain separate. That is the best data that we have. And then just, just to remind people that the way we get um, uh, material into the mineral associated is with fresh plant material and root exudates. And, um, and so we're gonna come back to that. All right, so with that information, I, I think it's, it, it's helpful to have that background information for whatever type of farming we do because soil carbon capture is really high on the national agenda, on the international agenda. And that's a good thing. 
Now, when I talk to the students at the University of Manitoba, they come out of all these courses into my organic course, and they're all just like, well, no-till is, is the best thing, and it's the only way to go. Um, and so, so that's, um, uh, that's something that's important. And, and we have to ask ourselves, is the tillage that we're using in organic agriculture actually causing some serious limitations in terms of soil carbon capture? What do we know about this? Well, we know that if you till, uh, you have to do something to, to heal that soil after that disruption. And this is just one example, but the use of cover crops in this meta-analysis, that means if, if the uh, data is to the right of this line, that means that the, the beneficial fungi in the soil benefited from the cover crop. And we know that, that, that if we go and do an aggressive tillage to get some quackgrass under control or some Canada thistle, the best thing to do is to get a plant started right away to restore that soil um, to its health. And um, there is very good data on this. Um, the cover cropping even appears to counteract some of the negative impacts of soil disturbance like tillage on uh, soil, um, arbuscular mycorrhizal form, uh, formation. System approaches that combine cover cropping and reduced tillage are, are, are re really good, but um, uh, increasing soil carbon storage and nutrient cycle, cycling can also uh, be done with strategic use of cover crops. And, and let me go to another study, this one in Canada from Alberta. Um, I'm, um, the, uh, this group, group set of University of Alberta. And you can read this on your own and you can also go to the paper. But what they were doing was asking the question, if we've got a long-term no-till field and we till it, are we like losing all the benefits? And what they found is that when those soils were deficient in nitrogen, then the tillage was particularly damaging. But when the soil was well endowed with nitrogen, the negative effect of the tillage was much less. And so here's what they wrote. Therefore, tillage reversal, that means going from no-till back to tillage, should be avoided as much as possible with grassland soils, chernozemic soils, when adopting without nitrogen fertilization. The implication for organic production is that if tillage is part of the cropping system, which it is, nitrogen additions are important, and in organic, this means adding legumes to the rotation. So this operation with our $200 disc here um, is not doing as much damage with tillage because it is putting a nitrogen-rich plant residue into the soil. And this faba bean will have leaked carbon and will have allowed mineral-associated carbon to be fixed. Now, I'm not saying tillage is good, but maybe tillage isn't as bad as we thought it was. Okay, back to this question though, soil capture of carbon is really high on the agenda. And that's a good thing. But there is a wild card here, and that is global warming. We know that the planet is warming. And it, if we don't do something, it will continue to warm and actually, unfortunately, get out of control. So this is a serious issue that we have to actually stop. But the global warming wild card actually is something that can really affect uh, our ability to store carbon in soils, and it might affect the two pools of carbon differently. And this is something that organic uh, farmers should really pay attention to because the story is actually good news. Global temperature is rising. Um, what is it doing to the soil carbon? Well, this fantastic study here 
uh, was led by uh, Ag Canada scientists, Ed Greg Rich at Ottawa. And what they did, I believe they did this in Lethbridge, they enriched plant material with radio labeled carbon. And then they took that plant material, put it in the soil in all these different locations in Canada. And they kept it there for over 10 years. And they monitored what was causing the soil carbon to be lost over time. And what they found, our study demonstrates an overriding predominance of temperature in governing the rate of residue decay, superseding everything else. And I've talked to these scientists in person about this. And yeah, the conclusion was that as the temperature goes up, there goes the carbon. And so increasing global temperature defeats some of our carbon capture uh, contributions. So like my friend uh, Rennie Van Acker says, you know, that dog don't hunt no more. <laughs> and so maybe the idea of carbon capture uh, is not going to be as effective. Uh, it won't be as temperatures go up. So that then raises the question, which carbon pool is most uh, vulnerable to loss because of higher temperatures? Is it the particulate pool or the mineral associated pool? So what I like to talk about, this is the dead crop residue tour uh, to, uh, uh, pool. And this is the, you know, the, the, the plant roots, the fresh plant material and the healthy soil biology pool. And so what happened is this group of scientists, they were out of Colorado State University. They uh, got a hold of data about 10 years of data from all these different sites around the world. And, um, and that allowed them to look at factors like nitrogen fertilization, elevated CO2 warming and precipitation and how it affected the soil carbon. And what they found is that overall, um, the uh, soil carbon as uh, with, with temperature uh, is gonna decline a little bit but it's going to decline mostly uh, due to loss of particulate organic matter or this pool here, which is what I call the no-till carbon. I don't mean to be disrespectful. Okay, so sticking with the same study, again, uh, at all these locations, um, <clears throat> it just published last year, here's, here's what they observed. Um, the amount in the in the soil carbon pool, they had about equal amounts of particulate organic, they're calling it carbon, but particulate organic matter and mineral associated. As they added more nitrogen, or as these scientists who had these studies added more nitrogen, uh, the proportion of the two pools stayed about the same. As uh, CO2 was elevated, because some of these experiments controlled that, uh, the particulate or carbon uh, organic matter increased. So as our atmospheric CO2 is going up and it's going up all the time, um, you know, we're getting increases in that, which is good news, might mean quicker nutrient cycling. But as the planet warms, you can see that we've lost more particulate organic matter versus mineral associated. So this tells us, this is evidence to suggest that the mineral associated organic matter is more stable in a warming world. And precipitation uh, has about an equal effect on both pools. Where's my cursor here? There it is. Now, getting back to the warming issue, which is real, which is happening, however people think it's happening, it's happening. Um, soil warming is more damaging than air temperature increases. Okay, so I'll repeat that. The warming of the soil was more damaging to the soil organic matter than an air temperature increase. So what does that mean for um, organic farmers? That means keep the soil covered um, like this farm, which I showed you last class is, and that makes the soil cooler. And so we now are in a situation where we need to keep our soils as cool as possible. Uh, and this is something that people in the tropics have figured out a long time ago. Um, so I think that's an important lesson. And then how do you keep soils cool? 
you grow cover crops, you grow green manures. And we've looked at these pictures before in this course, but these plants are actually not only adding nitrogen, they are really keeping the soil much cooler than if it's bare. Okay, half halfway done. Um, let's get back to the processes of organic matter formation, okay? Um, we in the organic community talk a lot about, you know, the soil biology. And what I had mentioned is that for plant material or uh, dissolved carbon from roots to get into organic matter, it has to go through this eye of the needle. So the soil microbiome is the eye of the needle that controls the amount of carbon going into that mineral associated pool. And now that we know at least from the evidence that we've seen that the mineral associated pool is more stable with climate change, we're very interested in increasing that pool. <clears throat> and that's the pool that people should really be paying us money for. Now there is evidence that organically managed soils do a better job of, of, of that soil biology. And these are some of the studies that I'll refer to today in the rest of the talk from Switzerland, Michigan, California, our Glenlee study. And we have a lot of really good Ag Canada studies on the prairies and in places like Ottawa and Guelph. I'm not going to talk about them, um, but they're also very useful. And this is a textbook from back in the 1920s, a German textbook, which, uh, which I uh, refer to often. Uh, and they're looking at fungi and bacteria. So, you know, mycorrhizal fungi were discovered in about 1890. Um, you know, nitrogen fixation was discovered in about the same time. Uh, and so uh, we've known about these things for a, for a long, long time. So let me start with mycorrhizal fungi. These are fungi that are, we consider them beneficial. If you've never thought of it before, think about how an evergreen tree on the, in the Canadian shield can grow on a rock. The reason it can grow is because the fungi link the nutrients in the rock to the plant. So they take some sugars from the plant, feed the fungus, the fungus goes into the rock, solubilizes nutrients, makes them available to the plant. Um, in agriculture, we know that we call them AMF, our buscular mycorrhizal fungi. So mycorrhiza, they increase phosphorus uptake. They increase, um, so this is a picture of a, I uh, believe a corn root. And here is the, the mycorrhizal network, the fungal network. It actually allows that plant to explore a lot more of the soil volume. So mycorrhiza are important. And it's also thought that they can help with micronutrient uptake. So are mycorrhiza any different in organic versus conventional? And our data would suggest yes. This is the work of Kathy Welch. She actually painstakingly uh, separated mycorrhizal spores because they actually start as spores. They're like seeds. And, um, and then uh, when the plant root grows close to them, the plant root sends a signal, said, hey, I'm here. And the spore will germinate, will infect the plant and then we'll go into the soil. Uh, and so what, what she found is in 100 grams of soil, a lot more uh, uh, mycorrhizal seeds or spores in the organic versus the conventional. So this is what our data is showing. And that doesn't mean that some conventional soils can't have healthy mycorrhiza, but this is, I'm showing you our data. And um, here again, we have our rotations at Glen Lee, we've got the prairie, which is the highest mycorrhizal colonization. Um, but um, the organic crops tend to have more mycorrhizal, for example, under conventional grain only, 32% of the plants infected, grain only organic, 49% infected. So this is a pretty consistent trend in the literature. When you have organic crops, you often have higher mycorrhiza. It actually, um, at Glen Lee, um, one of my grad students, Soleil Termel, looked at the micronutrients in our uh, wheat crops, and we actually observed uh, in an interaction. So in our better rotation, where we had alfalfa and grains, our organic gave us significantly higher levels of zinc. 
This is actually really practical for nutrition because this child here, if they're getting uh, their micronutrients through things like bread, uh, this child would have to eat, uh, could get the same zinc with less consumption of bread. And um, so nutritionists are very keen on understanding how different farming systems deliver nutrients. Now, the other, um, the other thing that we know is that mycorrhiza can kind of uh, give us tillage resistance. And uh, so based on our data uh, with higher mycorrhizal activity in our organic crops, we should have a better chance of as soon as that machine goes through, uh, these spores are going to, and we are growing another plant, uh, these spores will quickly germinate again and form uh, that, that, that mycorrhiza. Now, the other thing that affects the health of that soil microbiome, you know, that, that soil biology is the soil pH. It's actually hugely important. Low pH really slows down. It's, it's not good for the bacteria. It's not good for nitrogen fixation. And this is a story from this week's Western producer where people are starting to see that prairie soils, especially under no-till, are losing, are becoming more acidic. And this is uh, Ross McKenzie, uh, retired from Alberta agriculture, is a very well-respected person, and he basically confirms this. So can organic influence this? And the answer is yes. What we have observed at Glen Lee is, to my great surprise, is that the pH uh, in the conventional plots has been dropping over the 31 years whereas the pH in the organic plots has stayed neutral. Neutral pHs make these microbes, bacteria, much happier. They make them more efficient. So I'm not trying to pick on conventional agriculture. I mean, I'm just sharing facts that have been published in peer-reviewed journals. The, the people at the DOC trial in Switzerland, the one that I showed right at the beginning, they have measured exactly the same thing. And let me just go through some of their data. Uh, the highest, uh, the most, th this is the pH here. So they're at six, 6.57. Now European soils tend to be naturally a little bit more acidic than our prairie, most of our prairie soils. And if we look at, let's look at the lowest, uh, this is from 1977 and this is 1998. So it's over 20 years. Um, you can see this uh, treatment here has really dropped its pH. That's the conventional uh, system with mineral fertilizer. And if we look at the, um, at the uh, conventional with farmyard manure, it's there. And if we look at the organic with exactly the same amount of livestock units, it's there. So there's... Uh, big difference in pH. And then as we get to the biodynamic systems, um, they're even higher. So we're seeing a little bit of beneficial effects of the compost on boosting the pH as well. Now, this pH and Paul Mader, who was the soil microbiologist in the study, he's a friend and a colleague of mine. And he he said, you know, the pH is, is really what was driving a lot of the poor performance in the conventional system. And so those conventional farmers, they're going to start liming, they're going to have to lime their soil. That's going to cost them a lot of money because you have to add a lot of lime to raise the pH, a lot. Read the article in the Western Producer. Okay, so that's a lot of facts. You know, let's take a deep breath again. Okay, a little stretching. And now let's just tell some stories. Um, I want to share my first story from the Kellogg site at the Michigan State University. And it comes from the work of Cynthia Kellenbach and Stuart Grandy and others. Cynthia is now a professor at McGill University in Montreal. Lucky, lucky we have her in Canada now, uh, although agricultural science is so international. So what they had is a 30-year crop rotation study where they compared conventional and organic production. Here's the rotation, corn, soybean, wheat in the conventional, corn, soybean, wheat, and the organic, exactly the same, except they had a rye cover crop after the corn and a clover cover crop after the wheat. We look at the right left-hand side here. We take a look at the total carbon inputs 
going into these farming systems. And that includes the top growth, the seeds, and the cover crop biomass. No big surprise, the conventional system produced more biomass than the organic system. You know, if that had been, you know, so that that's totally understandable. But then when we look, when they looked at the soil organic carbon, which is the same as soil organic matter, the opposite occurred. This is odd. And so this raises the question, like, really? How can fewer total carbon inputs result in more soil organic carbon? Doesn't make any sense. Well, they explained it. They studied it. What they observed is that the carbon use efficiency was higher in the organic than the conventional. Over a two-year period with a number of sampling points and these asterisks mean this was statistically significantly higher, which means it's higher 19 times out of 20. So what that means is the microbes, for some reason, were functioning better in the organic system, and so a higher proportion of the carbon going into the system was actually fixed as soil carbon. I like to use this analogy. A soil that has low carbon use efficiency is like this tractor tire, lots of slippage, okay? Lots of, you're putting a lot of diesel fuel into the machine, you're making that wheel turn, but you're not getting a lot of traction. A high carbon use efficiency soil is one that has nice new lugs and it's much more efficient. And that is what's happening. In fact, Dr. Kallenbach uh, confirmed this by looking at the microbial growth rates. Um, and a higher microbial growth rate uh, is the reason for the higher carbon use efficiency. So basically the microbes were having more babies. They were happier, they were having bigger families, more activity, more activity, and that resulted in a higher carbon use efficiency. I think this is pretty exciting. I don't think it's gonna be long before we have soil test labs that will give farmers uh, a measurement. Um, there are some labs that do some of this. Uh, some of it is a little bit jumbled and not really well interpreted, but uh, I think we can get to the point where we have this type of data that is well interpreted for agronomists and farmers. So, Okay, like that's pretty profound, I think. Uh, when I learned this all, um, I was going like, wow, there's soils that have different levels of, of energy efficiency. And that's exactly what Dr. Paul Mader here at uh, the DOC trial, who's a, a you know, world famous soil microbiologist, has been, has been measuring in their experiment. And, and let me show you how they measure it. It's called a metabolic quotient. And this would be wonderful to have as a soil test. So what it is, is it measures the amount of CO2 respiration per unit of microbial biomass carbon. So it's kind of like if we took an analogy of a, of a cow, it's kind of like looking how much does the cow belch versus how much sort of digestible food is in the rumen. It's kind of the same measurement. So the lower the number, the better. You want to lose as little carbon dioxide as possible per unit of that microbial biomass carbon, which, as I showed you at Glen Lee, was actually higher in the organic and in, in the better organic rotations than under conventional management in our study. Okay, so let's just compare some of the values here. So this is the no fertilizer treatment, and here's the conventional mineral fertilizer. Both of them are similar at about 1.16, 1.14. So they're not different from each other. So adding fertilizer uh, did nothing to improve the energy efficiency. Uh, let's take, they don't have all the combinations here, but let's take the conventional farmyard manure. It's at 1.02 and the bioorganic uh, at 0.96. It's lower. It's not significantly lower, but it's lower. And if we compare the organic versus the uh, 
Uh, yeah. So, so what we're seeing, I could go through other comparisons here, but what we're seeing is some evidence that the organic systems are more efficient. And it's certainly if we look at, at uh, the bioorganic here compared to conventional mineral fertilizers, so 0 0.96, it is, you know, quite a bit lower than, um, than the uh, conventional mineral fertilizer. We also measured this at Glen Lee. This is our metabolic quotient numbers, and you can see they're sort of in the same range. Anytime you get a number below one means your soil is already quite efficient, and that is a function of our prairie soils. They are already, they're very good soils. I mean, they're the best soils in the world. Grassland soils are the best soils in the world. And um, we didn't notice any difference between our prairie or our uh, organic or conventional. Um, but keep in mind that we did see higher microbial biomass in the organic. There's the, uh, there's the two organic, there's the conventional after a drought, summer and rewetting. So, so it is a good news carbon story at Glen Lee, but we didn't notice any difference in energy efficiency. But I want to come back to this that uh, there are, you know, there is very good evidence to show that you can improve the energy efficient, the carbon energy efficiency of soils. And I think the ticket to this is, um, you know, good crop rotation, cover crops, maybe a little bit of strategic composted manure. Another story I want to tell you comes from California. And um, my heart goes out to this part of California where apparently, you know, there's atmospheric rivers just dropping all kinds of water onto, onto the area. So that, I mean, that's very dangerous. But this is the Russell Ranch, which is um, located uh, on the campus of the University of California at Davis. And they've, uh, this is the same age as Glen Lee, uh, they, but they had more resources than we did. It's a massive experiment. And and one of the people that worked there was Johann Six. Okay, so there is his name here, Johann Six. He's uh, now back in Switzerland. He's really one of the world's most amazing um, soil soil health scientists. Um, and uh, Kong and Six uh, worked at the Russell Ranch, and they looked at different cover crops, and they were asking. Um, uh, how much of this cover crop carbon is actually fixed in the soil as organic matter? And uh, what they observed is, um, well, first of all, we know that soil microbes will fix more root material than top growth material. And that's what they measured. That's, I'm not showing you that here, but they measured that. And that's well established. Roots are more important than top growth anytime. But they also observed um, that carbon from a winter hairy vetch cover crop in a tomato corn crop rotation in California was stored more efficiently in soil organic matter under organic than conventional conditions. So this is what they observed, the ratio of root to residue derived whole uh, soil carbon. They again labeled their carbon. They're very, very good scientists. This is a, a very good journal. And you can see the organic system actually fixed the highest portion of the carbon coming from that cover crop compared to the conventional, and they also had a low input treatment. So this is more evidence that organically managed soil soils have a higher carbon use efficiency. Now, I'm not saying every organically managed soil does. If it's poorly, poorly managed, it's not going to have these attributes. But we're showing systems that are realistic, and are well managed. That's very exciting. And when we talk about carbon capture and COP27 and you know carbon credits, th this is information that we should be internalizing into our policies. Okay, so now we've captured all this carbon and soil, and we've got these two pools. And I hope there's been, you know, it's been helpful to understand, you know, the carbon cycle in soils a little bit better. And also talking about the fact that organic agriculture, because it tends to increase the mineral associated organic matter pool, actually is not as bad as most people make it out to be. And it actually might be quite a bit better.
The other part of the equation is we need these soils to produce nutrients. We're just we're not just farming them to fi fix carbon. And that's called provisioning, using the soil as a source of nutrients for organic crop production. Well, organic matter does, in fact, have a lot of nutrients. And uh, I think Michael Teeley put it in the in the in the in the chat on the first lecture that when we talk about nitrogen, we have to talk about carbon. Well, he's absolutely right. At the long-term trials in Brothamstead, they used a radio-labeled carbon and they or nitrogen, and they put it um, they put it into the soil, and then um, after um, after a year or two, this is where they found uh, the nitrogen. A very small portion of it was nitrate nitrogen, which is what you measure in your um, in your soil test. Most of it was in the soil organic matter. Some was still in the stubble in the biomass of the barley crop that they labeled. And this just illustrates that so much nitrogen and other nutrients are in the organic matter. Now we have to be careful about how we wring out that organic matter to get those nutrients because we want the nutrients, but we don't want to lose the organic matter. So we need high organic, high efficient soils, first of all, so they can bring us the nutrients without losing the organic matter. Okay, we were talking about nitrogen. If we look at our Glenlee rotation, uh, this is a measure of the total mineralizable nitrogen. This is the nitrogen supplying potential of the different rotations. And if we look here at a grain only conventional 141, we compare it to uh, a forage grain conventional, not much different. Uh, our two uh, high functioning organic systems, forage grain organic, not, not any different forage grain organic, plus a little bit of compost manure to make the phosphorus deficiency go away, we can see significantly higher nitrogen uh, supplying potential. The other interesting thing about provisioning nutrients in an organic system is the enzyme activity. And this is uh, what we had the opportunity to measure in the Soil Health Institute study, where we looked at um, these three enzymes. The one on the left is an enzyme that makes that solubilizes carbon. This one makes phosphorus available, and this one makes sulfur available. And the lowest enzyme levels are almost always observed in the conventional systems. Conventional grain only, low. Convector low, low. The highest tend to be observed in the organic system. So I'll, I'll say our high functioning forage grain organic system, uh, you can see significantly higher enzyme activities. And when we add compost, sometimes it goes up a little bit. Um, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, as long as we don't deplete all the sulfur out of the organic matter, as long as we don't deplete all the phosphorus out of the organic matter, it's a good thing. It means that these soils are able to provision these nutrients well by enzymes breaking down, um, breaking down the inorganic forms of these nutrients. That's exciting. I think it's very exciting, uh, and it shows why some of these organic systems are fairly high functioning. Couple of couple of last points. Um, one of the other surprise uh, surprises about this big study was that some of the the long term studies had grazing included in them, and where grazing was included, soil organic matter increased. And I remember hearing about this from Alan Franz Lubers many years ago. So I went back to those papers and sure enough, what, what he had concluded exactly the same thing. Under some conditions, grazing can actually allow the soil to fix more carbon. So this is what Alan Franz Lubers in Georgia uh, discovered. He grew this, I think, um, uh, this grass, uh, Baha'i grass, I think it was, and over a five-year period. And it was managed in three different ways. It was hayed every year, it was left unharvested, or it was grazed. And I and it was grazed at a couple of intensities. And I always thought the unharvested 
would be would have the most carbon. That just made logical sense, just like that Michigan study. And yes, it did have more carbon than where where the where the hay was taken off, but it had less carbon than when the animals were grazing it. And at all the animal grazing intensities, there was actually more carbon. Over time, it accumulated faster. I remember presenting this at a department seminar, and people said, "Okay, this guy has totally lost the plot. Um, you know, this is just completely never going to happen." Um, <clears throat> and so, this you can read this on your own when you go back to the video. And it sort of talks a little bit about um, the, the numbers actually involved. And you can go to the, the, the study. But I want to refer to a couple of other studies. And these are, these are from the Great Plains. Let me quote from this 2002 study. Grazers stimulated above ground, below ground, and hold grassland productivity by 21, 35, and 32% respectively. Root production was stimulated seven times more than shoot production, indicating that the major effect of herbivores, which is grazing cattle, in this system was at a positive feedback on root growth. Another study, defoliation stimulated carbon exudation from roots by 1.5 fold. With a concomitantly, that means at the same time, the rhizosphere, the area around the root, microbial biomass increased as well. So um, this is uh, asks a lot of this raises a lot of questions in my mind, like how how do cattle grazing activities actually cause this to happen? And well, some of the theories are that when a, a cow wraps her tongue around the, the plant and tugs, uh, a lot of those root hairs which are attached to the roots sort of come off and well, the microbes just gobble them up right away. Um, so that that's a major mechanism. Um, and that's sort of the extent of my knowledge. <laughs> uh, some things that I've heard speculated on is that the rumen fluid, uh, which would leak onto the plant, might stimulate the plant from growing because the plant is, you know, the animal's slobbering all the time. And that's that apparently could be a good thing. And then, of course, when you know you put on your sort of natural systems agriculture hat, you say, wait a minute, this is how these grasslands evolved. They evolved under grazing. So maybe it's not such a surprise that they like being grazed. So this is this is quite interesting. And um, now overgrazing is probably not going to give you these benefits. On the other hand, things like twice overgrazing, which any of you in the dryland prairie region will have heard about, a wonderful innovation from, from our colleagues at North Dakota State University. Um, you know, it is it is one of those techniques which is probably going to be able to uh, cause this kind of stimulation. And that's why it's such a good grazing system. Okay, and the second, uh, the, the, the other point that I wanted to end off with was Let's think about the whole profile. When we think, when, when uh, scientists measure carbon, they tend to measure the top layer. And uh, by the way, there's another very good article in the Western Producer this week um, on how to properly measure soil carbon. And Ben Ellert from Lethbridge uh, gave a talk at the Manitoba Agronomist Conference, and they did a story on that. And it's it's very important that you always measure the same volume of soil. And it's, it's very easy to misrepresent carbon sequestration by poor technique of measuring. So agronomists know this and just keep doing a good job. But that's the surface. Let's go deeper. And if we look at this, this is actually our work that we did in Uruguay years ago, Roberta Gentile's masters. And we looked here at tall fescue and alfalfa and chicory. Chicory is a very interesting plant, uh, which can uh, be very useful for organic livestock production, by the way, which uh, maybe we'll talk about next year. Um, and you can see those root systems go down to 100, 100 centimeters, um, three feet, um, and, and deeper. And, and here's a picture of an alfalfa root uh, in the clay soils of the Red River Valley. And, and you know, we know root systems go down deep and um, but we always measure the surface. So, so here I'd like to share a little bit of research. Uh, this this uh, actually is where scientists have studied the carbon all the way down the profile. And I do believe we've had somebody from Argentina on listening as a participant. 
And uh, I think that person has wrote, written just a hello from Argentina. And so I decided to use this data from Argentina to honor this person who participates. And also, congratulations on, I think the Argentinians won the World Cup. I hope I got that right. Um, anyways, I, I have done a little bit of work in Uruguay here in the southwest corner, but uh, also had the opportunity and a little bit familiar with this sort of landscape. But what uh, they observed here is um, the soil carbon down the profile with milk vetch, alfalfa, a clover, and uh, a check. Um, and we can see that as we go down the profile, especially looking here at, you know, 1.5 to 2 meters. I mean, 2 meters is like, uh, is, you know, 6 feet. Um, and we get down there, you can see the alfalfa, for example, has put a lot more carbon in that zone than um, than where nothing, no perennial was grown. So the, the perennials really start showing their advantage after 0.6 meters, which is about, about two feet. So, um, you know, the, the top layer, um, good, but once you get below that top layer, these perennials really start shining in terms of the amount of carbon that they're leaving in the soil. Um, this, uh, this carbon is thought to be extra stable because it's just in a, in a place in the soil profile that's definitely going to be cooler and, uh, and there's less turnover. And so this is an important reason to put perennials in the, in the rotation. And it's why people are excited about perennial grains, Kernza, grass fed livestock production, anything that gets perennials into the landscape. And then when they looked at the soil carbon stocks, the amount of um, actual amount of carbon they put in the soil, you can see um, that the area where they didn't grow any perennials, they actually lost carbon. But here, uh, if we look at alfalfa, for example, um, you know, a big chunk of the carbon was put between 1.5 and 2 meters. So, um, uh, so it's a very, very good way to sequester carbon. And so there's different theories for why this happens. Um, it could be because that's where the big root system, like I showed in this picture, grows. It could be because uh, there's a lot of root hairs. And so you, these are called fine roots and, and they turn over and the microbes eat them and they get well secured into mineral associated uh, organic matter. Could be that. Or it could be the fact that uh, maybe the plants are leaking carbon at the surface and that, that carbon is, is actually leaching down and then eventually getting eaten by bugs. And there, there, there's a number of reasons that, that could, could bring us to this point. But anyways, I just wanted to talk about the, the, the importance of perennials in adding, adding carbon. And th this is actually from Roberta's work in, in uh, Uruguay, where we actually looked at kind of the same thing there were two crop rotations, one that was, we call it the annual rotation, only grain crops. And then the pasture rotation had four years of, of uh, um, bird's foot trefoil and tall fescue, and then four years of, of grain crops. And we separated the carbon into mineral associated, and uh, which is over here on the right, and particulate organic carbon. And you can see that the mineral associated was a much larger pool, and that's often the case, not always. And we noticed that if you look here, the pasture rotation put more carbon uh, between 40 and 60 centimeters than the annual rotation. And so again, just giving an idea that the soil organic matter down at depth uh, needs perennials and you can actually boost up that carbon. And that has other, other benefits as well, right? It helps with water infiltration and, and that type of thing. So this is my last slide here, but my second to last slide is, is just um, to alert us all to what Henry Jansen has to say. Henry Jansen uh, is retired now. He's a well, very well-respected scientist who had most of his career at Agriculture Canada at Lethbridge. It's one of the world's top carbon scientists. And, and I think he would not disagree with anything that I had said. 
and uh, he, you know I've had the chance to work with Henry. We've co-supervised graduate students, but there's one thing that Henry likes to stress is that you know in the end what you need is a lot of plant material going into the soil, and so he and a bunch of colleagues from around the world, from the United Kingdom and the Netherlands, wrote a paper called Photosynthetic Limits on Carbon Sequestration in crop Croplands. He basically said, look, the, you have to start with plants. <laughs> and so I think we have to agree, agree with him on that. That is so important. So he says, the higher the plant growth, the more carbon is available for both harvest and replenishment of soil organic matter. One strategy, for example, is continued research towards greater use of perennial crops, including forages, which maintain photosynthesis for longer durations and allocate more carbon to plant parts not subject to harvest and removal, notably in root systems. Where perennial systems are not feasible, their benefits can be mimicked by extending and enhancing photosynthesis through measures such as cover cropping, diversified cropping schemes, judicious crop nutrition and promoting perennials in unharvested landscape areas. Um, and we've talked about all these things. And then um, what, what we would layer on top of this, this paper uh, is the idea that we want soils that have a higher, a high carbon use efficiency. So all that good carbon that farmers are working hard to bring into that soil is actually uh, a higher proportion of it is used in the soil system to both enrich the soil with carbon, making it more productive and, and make it better able to provision nutrients for our crops. And I think the prize goes to the three gen organics um, in Ontario who are surrounded by corn soybean farmers who don't have much growing in the fall and the winter and the spring, and these farmers do. And I think uh, they're taking those lessons to heart. And final comment before I thank you is that that dog may not hunt no more. If we don't stop runaway global warming, the conversations that we have around carbon are going to be academic. We cannot let that happen. And organic agriculture, because we limit our use of fossil fuels, I think is one of the good uh, initiatives uh, in that regard, but we have to make it productive. So thank you again for your attention. I'm looking forward to harvesting all those questions. And tomorrow, uh, I'm, I'm, I'll tell you, I will answer everyone because that's what I'm going to do uh, between today and tomorrow. So now I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it back to Laura. Martin, I have never met anyone who can, uh, who can break down such complicated topics into uh, analogies and examples that we can actually understand and you brought it all together at the end um you know to to bring it down to our reality which is a changing climate so thank you so much for that and uh i'm uh I hope everybody's uh, brains aren't uh, too exploded by this talk, but I think you'll find that when you read over the resources that Martin has produced to go along with this, um, it will help you synthesize this. So thank you so much for listening today. And Martin, I really look forward to figuring out how you're going to answer all those questions tomorrow. Um, so we are going to experiment a little bit tomorrow. I guess Marla and I will have to talk about how we can figure out how to unmute some of you so we can hear your real voices. Um, I don't like it that we've had to restrict you to the chat box because there's, there's so many of you who have been uh, following avidly and participating all along and we would like to hear your voices. So thank you. And again, just a, a quick note to thank you, our sponsors for it, for, uh, for sticking with us and uh, thank you. Um, can't say any more than that. So on the screen here, you uh, should see the um, CEU credits. Remember these credits are only for professional agronomists who have a number. Um, so if you're having trouble figuring out how to scan this QR code, please just email me at laura.telford at 
gov.mb.ca and I can send you the physical sign-in sheets that I can then uh, submit on your behalf so you can get those credits. So thank you again, Martin, and everybody for being engaged with a very complicated topic. Um, so we will see you tomorrow. Bye.